when the world shut down, uh, consumers were looking to find other avenues to replace their daily ritual of visiting their favorite coffee house. Um, that led to that led them to finding us. People start buying more coffee online. You can't go to your Starbucks. You can't go to X Y Z coffee house that's on your corner. Now you have to this idea of home barista is like mm-hmm. is now your reality, right? It's like okay, I, I still need my fix. How can I get this fix? Right. And we started as a a B to C or, or online brand. Um, so while other businesses were trying to figure out how to stand up their e-commerce presence, that's how we started. So um, mm-hmm. it just gave us a competitive advantage over um, other, you know, o- other coffee brands. Layer on the fact that in the summer of 2020, we were all forced to watch the murder of George Floyd, which compelled mm-hmm. people, which compelled the masses to find some way to do something in response, right? Some people mm-hmm. marched, some people boycotted, and other people invested and conducted business with small Black-owned businesses. Um, mm-hmm. So like that allyship definitely uh, was was welcomed, <laughs> um, being very, very frank. And um, it was that moment that we started to see a shift in just our overall brand awareness and, and therefore the, the revenue that, that we're generating. You're listening to the Black to Business Podcast, an educational podcast providing Black entrepreneurs with the tools and resources to start and grow their businesses. We chat with vetted Black entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business owners as they provide tips and resources to help take your business to the next level. I'm your host, Monique T. Marshall. Welcome back. So before I jump into today's episode, I want to let you know that it's kind of bittersweet because this is the last episode of our Black Men Who Lead series, where we invite Black men on the podcast who lead in their community and in their businesses. And we also highlighted 30 awesome men-led companies on our website. So be sure to check out the full list at blacktobusiness.com forward slash Black Men Who Lead 2022. Now, on to today's episode, we have the pleasure of being joined by Rod Johnson, co-founder of the specialty beverages brand Black & Bold. And you may have seen their coffee and tea products in major retail stores like Target, Whole Foods, and other national retailers. The beautiful thing about Black & Bold and what the founders Rod and Purnell have built is that since the brand's inception, they've intentionally built a business model rooted in social impact. They pledge 5% of their profits to initiatives aligned to sustaining youth programming, enhancing workforce development, and eradicating youth homelessness. Absolutely amazing. So today we're covering it all. And Rod is taking us behind the scenes of what it's like to start and grow a coffee and tea brand and how they went from operating in a tiny garage to nearly $1 million in profit in just three years. Amazing. Oh, and I also want to mention that they had no prior experience in the industry, nor did they know anything about coffee and tea. They saw a void in the market and a lack of representation and used those things along with their love for the coffee shop culture to build a brand that is now competing with legacy brands that have been in the industry for decades. So during our conversation, Rod is going to share how he overcame dealing with imposter syndrome, how building a community-focused organization attracted major partnerships and brand deals like Ben & Jerry's and the NBA. He's also going to give you some tips on how you can not only attract these types of opportunities for yourself, but also how to maintain these partnerships. He's also sharing how to prepare for and deal with sudden increase in demand. This episode is jam-packed with goodness, so let's dive in. Hello, Rod. Welcome to the Black to Business podcast. I am so excited about today's conversation because it is a new conversation for us. But first, welcome to the Black to Business podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. So what I like to do with all of my guests is first, if you could just start off by briefly sharing with my listeners, what is it that you do a little bit about you and how did you get where you are today? I know we're going to dive deeper throughout the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So as mentioned, my name is Rod Johnson. I'm the co-founder and CMO of Black and Bold Specialty Beverages or Specialty Coffee. Um, We are uh, a relatively young brand. Uh, In fact, we just celebrated our four-year anniversary and it was all predicated on this idea of 
bridging the gap between specialty beverages and community impact. Uh, my mm-hmm. friend and I started this business out of out of his garage with, with no real uh, experience and um, ha- have ultimately found some success around something that we really care about, that being good coffee and tea and, and giving back to, to our communities. Uh, prior to this, um, I, I worked in the nonprofit world as a fundraiser for academic and healthcare institutions, while my, my business partner worked on a for-profit side of the fence as a um, as a retail merchandiser and, and a uh, brand business developer, um, if you will. So um, again, we uh, what brought us to starting our entrepreneurial journey is you know not being completely satisfied and fulfilled by those respective careers, and you know wanting to do something that was ultimately a little more resonant with who we are and where we felt our journeys could go. Love it, and thank you for sharing that. And you all are just, you said, four years old and you yes. all have, yeah, you have accomplished a lot. And we're going to get into how you all are really changing the coffee and tea industry. So first, I want to really dive into what inspired you all to get into the coffee industry. Yeah, what inspired us was simply recognizing that there was a void in, mm-hmm. in something that we were experiencing every day, um, you know, drinking coffee and tea. Uh, both Pernell and I had spent a lot of time in coffee shops, given our respective careers. We did a lot of traveling and, you know, the coffee shop just served as a as a good meeting place, you know, whether for a good landing spot, if you will, whether for ourselves or when we were conducting meetings on the road. And um, you kind of fall in love with the, the coffee shop culture It's built on community. Everyone's there for a common reason. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's a sense of inclusivity. Um, but you know, there there's a lack of, of representation, if you will, as it pertains to who frequents those coffee shops and then therefore who owns and staffs those coffee shops. Um, and so we, we realized that um, the, the coffee house industry or the co- coffee industry it, overall, um, you know, wasn't necessarily catering to, to a broad demographic. In fact, like I said, many coffee shops have the stigma of being exclusive and sometimes elitist. So taking mm-hmm. all that into consideration, we have the, we, the inspiration we needed to start the company. Plus, we figured if we were going to leap, <laughs> take a leap of faith, if you will, as an entrepreneur, uh, it should be at least around something that we were familiar with and enjoy. Um, that way we could always have access to it. So I right. uh, just had some some just general curiosity and um, put that, you know, uh, to to something that we were, we already had some familiarity with. And right. So the interesting thing about that is, so there was this thing I came across in that research shows that African-Americans are least likely to, than any other ethnic groups in the U.S. to select coffee as their beverage of choice. So when I look at Black and Bold, uh, that seems to be your target audience. Am I correct? Yes, that's part of it for sure. Okay, we, so we, um, part of it. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's part of your target audience. So with this in mind, how did you go about really getting this community? Because you do have a diverse audience, I'm assuming. So you get this community that's not so much in this group of people that do like this beverage. So how do you define how am I going to win these people over to be my target market? And how has that reception been for you all? Got it. Got it. So uh, one, that, that's a really interesting statistic. Um, and without knowing what study you're referencing in particular, I would attribute that that being that uh, African-Americans uh, under index with consuming coffee. I, I would attribute that to a couple of things, but mainly access. Um, mm-hmm. I recall growing up uh, and not seeing any upscale businesses in my neighborhood, let alone upscale coffee shops. Uh, And considering that coffee houses were the guardians of the specialty coffee experience or or top tier coffee experience, um, I'm not surprised that we under index with the consumption of coffee. Again, going back to my childhood, the adults I saw drinking coffee were relegated to what was on the shelf and what was in close proximity. Mm -hmm. And that red can (laughs) that that we are all familiar with, it's not necessarily synonymous with top tier taste. So many people's introduction to coffee starts at a deficit, you know, um, 
you know, I even take into consideration my own journey. I wasn't a coffee drinker prior to starting the company. Uh, in mm-hmm. fact, my coffee experience was something to the tune of like adding an espresso shot to my chai tea latte from Starbucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, it's because of that, um, that our business is, is built to provide consumers with their own aha moment. And mm-hmm. we can explore, expose more people to better quality we think that that will translate into lifelong customers. So who, who are our customers? You mentioned mm-hmm. um, our, our customers are people who care about a company that stands for more than just selling a product um, and welcomes and represents them in a way that they don't necessarily get from other brands. Um, that could be from our sourcing practices uh, to our philanthropic efforts um, that we were associated with the purchase of our product or, or just our overall disposition and how we conduct business. We exist for the people who care about those things. And so with that being said, what were some of the obstacles that you all initially faced when you were starting out and how did you overcome those? Yeah. Um, well, one, we were definitely not immune to them um, as <laughs> you know, many brands. like We faced our fair share of obstacles as with anyone starting something from nothing. Um, mm-hmm. Some of those obstacles include dealing with imposter syndrome. Um, mm-hmm. As I mentioned, you know, neither my business partner or I had any formal background or training in the coffee industry. It's not like we were baristas or we come from coffee farming families. Like we just spend a lot of time in coffee shops. So that was our POV and why, why we started it. And the, the learning curve was very steep. <laughs> we we right. watched a, a ton of YouTube videos and put in countless hours developing a craft. Um, so, you know, with that, you know, we are now competing with legacy brands that have dominated the industry for decades. So that imposter syndrome is real because that can be intimidating at some point. Um, in addition to that, we were ignorant to a lot of processes and opportunities that could have accelerated our growth. For example, um, not having established banking relationships hindered how quickly we were able to make investments necessary to scale, right? We didn't have the capital to go buy the equipment that we needed to streamline our processes. We did a lot of stuff very early on out of Pernell's garage, very mm-hmm. manual process. And it was because because we didn't know how to navigate the banking system. We didn't know what questions to ask. We didn't know, you know, who would be more favorable to providing us the financing that we need, given uh, us being a small business or, or diverse supplier, et cetera. It was, it just took a lot of learning. Um, mm-hmm. And so when I say like we built this from scratch, like I mean, in every aspect of our business, um, our experience with, you know, and I, I harp on securing financing because that's that's important. You need money to do things. So our right. experience with securing financing definitely falls under the uh, I, if I knew then what I know now category. Right. So that, right. that would have helped us significantly if we have the knowledge that we have today way back then. And then lastly, a barrier that we experience that is should be no surprise is the pandemic, right? Like mm-hmm. that that presented some significant barriers for us, especially early on. Uh, in fact, in early 2020, we had just announced our national distribution with Target. Um, mm-hmm. And two months after that, the world shut down. <laughs> so while we were celebrating, the universe had different plans, right? At least right. for a couple of months. <laughs> uh, it was little to no foot traffic in the store. So that means people were not buying coffee. And we really had a, a gut check and we were having some heart to heart conversations and like, hey, if this continues, I don't know how much longer we're going to be able to stay open a- as a business. We may have to sunset this idea. And, um, you know, those were very, very trying times early on. And um, obviously it, it's turned around for us. But um, again, the, the pandemic presented uh, some barriers that. Um, you know, many businesses were were unable to overcome. So I'm very right. grateful that we were able to power through each of those obstacles that we were presented, um, and um, it, we're better for it <laughs> um, because right. we, we at least know how we're built. We know what type of you know, like our fortitude. We know what our our tolerance is for uh, curveballs, and um, that's part of being an entrepreneur. Yes. I totally agree. And so how were you all, because you all had that where you faced during COVID and 
one of the things is you all have built a brand that has reached seven figures annual revenue. That's something I saw as well. Um, what do you think was that moment or what kind of catapulted your brand? Um, and yeah. what were some of the things that you feel that you all were doing right? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, the, the pandemic has been a bad word for many business owners, especially mm -hmm. small black owned businesses. Um, there was an alarming statistic that I read saying something to the tune of more than 40% of small black owned businesses closed their doors permanently, permanently yeah. in the last two years, right? Which is extremely unfortunate. Um, our experience though has been the opposite. Um, so what I mean by that is when the world shut down, uh, consumers were looking to find other avenues to replace their daily ritual of visiting their favorite coffee house. Um, that led to that led them to finding us. Um, you know, people start buying more coffee online. You can't go to your Starbucks. You can't go to X Y Z coffee house that's on your corner. Now you have to. This idea of home barista is like mm -hmm. is now your reality, right? It's like, okay, I, I still need my fix. How can I get this fix? Right. And we started as a, a D2C or, or online brand. Um, so while other businesses were trying to figure out how to stand up their e-commerce presence, that was that's how we started. So mm -hmm. um, it just gave us a competitive advantage over um, other, you know, other coffee brands. Layer on the fact that in the summer of 2020, we were all forced to watch the murder of George Floyd, which compelled mm -hmm. people, which compelled the masses to find some way to do something in response, right? Some mm -hmm. people marched, some people boycotted, and other people invested and conducted businesses with small business, conducted business with small black owned businesses. Um, mm -hmm. So like that allyship uh, definitely uh, was was welcomed, <laughs> um, being very, very frank. And um, it was that moment that we started to see a shift in just our overall brand awareness and, and therefore the, the revenue that, that we're generating. So, you know, we just checked off a lot of boxes um, for people. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, just to continue to, to catapult um, that, um, that, that growth and that ascension, uh, we partner with a retailer that for as long as I can remember has been very overt in their support of diverse suppliers, that retailer being Target. Like Target yeah. is serious about providing the space for black owned businesses and, and minority owned businesses to thrive. And um, we have been the um, we've, had, we've been the beneficiaries of of um, of that relationship. Right. The, the opportunities and overall support from the organization is immeasurable. When you think about mm -hmm. this, it's, it's hard to duplicate um, being featured in a target commercial. That's not something that we will be able to do ourselves, but because we have shared values, because we are a community, we're both community, um, focused, um, you know, that then allows for us to unlock some really, really cool opportunities that ultimately, um, allows us to, uh, generate revenue that we then in turn give back to our nonprofit pledge partners. We give uh, five percent of our proceeds to organizations that support youth in need across America. So, you know, doing something that you do every day, drinking cups of coffee, ultimately is reinvested back in the community and Target, along with those other um, uh, things that I mentioned, just help us do that at scale. I love it, and that is so amazing. The give back that you all are doing and the social impact that you are making, um, because one of the things was that in creating your business, it was important for you all to have a company that revolved around social impact model. Whether, like you mentioned, a percentage of the proceeds going to the charity, why was this important to you all? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Pernell and I were raised in Gary, Indiana, and mm -hmm. Gary, Indiana is no different than any other inner city community in America. Um, and in fact, it's infamous claim to fame, uh, or at least one of its claims to fame, uh, as being the murder capital, uh, or was being the murder capital wow. uh, of America, um, during the nineties, a, a very, um, tough time, um, mm -hmm. for, for, for that community. And, and we grew up in the height of that. Um, and it wasn't always the case, right? Um, you know, so similar to Detroit, um, Gary and therefore Northwest Indiana was the 
epicenter for the steel industry. And when those jobs were shipped overseas and then, you know, it, it left the community to fend for itself. These people had to find alternative means in order to get the bare necessities. And, um, you know, that because we know that, because we understand that plight is not relegated to just our city, we knew that uh, if we were going to build a business, we wanted to take communities like that along for the ride. So we had some back and forth, Pernell and I, on how best to 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 deliver against that promise. Um, mm-hmm. We thought about doing a one for one, right? So think about Tom's shoes. I don't know if you are familiar with that brand, but mm-hmm. if you bought a pair of shoes, they would donate a pair of shoes to uh, a, a, to communities in need. Um, uh, then we thought about, Hey, maybe we should just focus on one, um, one subject matter, right? Maybe we should try to teach kids about finance or invest in financial literacy for kids, or, um, you know, maybe we should provide book bags. I don't know. We just threw a lot of ideas against the wall, but what made the most sense was, okay, let's just give a percentage of what we do to some organizations that are doing the work in these communities that, we are familiar with. So we vetted out 15 organizations. And um, so far in our journey, we've been able to donate over $100,000 to those different organizations. And um, that, again, is uh, it's amazing that the community and our consumers have helped us to, to do that. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to pour into the people that need it the most, that, that, that being the kids of America. Love it. So beautiful. And speaking of community, uh, what role has the Black community played in the growth of Black and Bold? I mean, a key role, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean that I don't know how to measure that. I mean, it, it's hard mm-hmm. for me to say, like, you know, we can attribute X, Y, Z dollars or X, Y, Z mm-hmm. opportunity. I just think that, you know, a lot of people see themselves in our, in us, in our stir- story and, and what we're trying to do. Um, and it makes it easier for them to um, support and therefore do business with, with a brand like ours. Um, I, I can vehemently say that uh, we would not have amassed the, the little bit of success that we had to this point w- without that community. Um, like our, you know, <laughs> that's where we started, right? Like we looked mm-hmm. at to our, fr- our friends and our family to be like, hey, we're, we're trying this new thing. You know, would you be interested? And and I will argue that that was the hardest group to convince <laughs> is our friend, friends mm-hmm. and family. But um, be, once we got over that, that barrier, um, the loyalty has been again, immeasurable and, and something that I'm, I'm super, super grateful for. So um, we'll, we'll, everything that we do keeps the keeps that community in mind and they show up and show out for us all the time. Yes. And I ask that because uh, similar to what you just said is why community is so important when it comes to supporting businesses, just for those who are listening and how you all have felt that impact of the importance of community uh, from what you have done. So like you said, you wouldn't be kind of where you are today without that support. Yeah, that, that's a fact. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't see it any other way. Right. Like mm-hmm. I, I want to make sure that the home team is rooting for me. Right. Like I don't want to go play an away game and then people are, you know, singing my praises. But when I go home, they're like, ah, you know, I, they don't, that there isn't that same level of connectivity. So I'm grateful right. that the community, like I said, shows up and show out for us. I mean, I, I could, there was, um, we all know the, the, the power that is black Twitter, right? Like yes. black Twitter is, is a, is a force. And uh, yeah. I remember during the summer of 2020, there was a tweet that went viral uh, mm. and it listed black owned businesses to support. And we were atop that list. I think they listed them alphabetically, right? So wow. thank goodness that our name is listed. Uh, it begins with a B, <laughs> right? Uh, and but that tweet it caught fire, and it, wow. I, 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 in one day, I mean, there there was some we had some record breaking numbers that and some internal record breaking numbers like just mm-hmm. within a week's time of that tweet going viral. So. Um, again, you know, black people showing up and showing out for for one of their own was on full display at that moment. So yeah, it's just a there's so many different iterations of how um, the black community continues to support us, and we want to do everything we can to reciprocate and, and be a great example. 
I love that. I love that. The power of Twitter. Someone just asked me the other day, what is black Twitter? Like, is it a department? <laughs> and I was like, no, it's just like a culture there. You know, I'm not on Twitter like that, but I'm like, I know black Twitter now. Yeah. So, <laughs> black so, Twitter is, it's amazing, right? I mean, yeah. we've seen some, some wonderful things and some like phenomenal things have come as a result of black Twitter doing its thing. And, um, I, I can say that we've been on the uh, on the favorable end uh, uh, of what yes. can happen from Black Twitter, and I want to keep it that way. <laughs> yes. So one of the things, like speaking of growth, um, you kind of mentioned your partnership and your work with Target. Uh, you all have had these amazing partnerships with some other brands like Amazon, Ben & Jerry's, and even the NBA. So how did like these partnerships, if you could just talk about how did they come to be and what do they entail? Sure. So um, I, they are all very different, but I will mm -hmm. say this. The one thing that they have in common is that they reached out to us. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, and that is very much so uncommon. Um, and I would attribute that to the like what we stand for as a business. So mm -hmm. let's take Ben and Jerry's, for example. Uh, we partnered with Ben and Jerry's to bring to market a limited edition um, uh, a cold brew ice cream, cold brew coffee ice cream called Changes Brewing. Um, and this amazing, delicious treat uh, was, uh, uh, it was meant to bring awareness and highlight some very important legislation around um, law enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a, a law that was, um, that Congresswoman Cori Bush was looking to get passed called the People's Response Act. Uh, I won't dare try to talk about all of the nuance of that mm -hmm. bill, but what I do know is that the, the intent of the bill was to divest from systems that were, um, that were, that overcriminalized black communities and reinvest into resources that will better serve the black community, right? So we think about, you know, people having mental health episodes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the police are the necessary, should necessarily be the first responders. Maybe someone who has some, uh, has a background or built a career in dealing with mental health pay or dealing with someone who's having a, a mental health episode. Maybe that's a mm -hmm. better approach. So this bill was meant to just reimagine how we serve the black community and uh, Ben and Jerry's use this partnership with us to help draw attention to it. And um, again, that, that's just, you know, we're very grateful to be a part of that, of that, of that journey. And it, it, it speaks to um, the type of company Ben and Jerry's is, right? They, mm -hmm. they are B Corp and B Corp are, B Corps are organizations that prioritize purpose as much as profit. So we got Tom's, like I mentioned earlier, that give a shoe, for every shoe that you buy, you have uh, Patagonia, you have uh, Shea Moisture, you got Ben and Jerry's, you got us. These people that stand for more than just selling something, they want mm -hmm. to do good in the world. And Ben and Jerry's, in my opinion, is on the forefront of everything that uh, that B Corp stands about. And their partnership with us in relation to the legislation, um, I, I think what was, you know, um, the holy trifecta, if you will. Um, so that was a really cool partnership. And, and similar to that, the partnership with the NBA was um, the NBA doubling down on them being the most progressive sport league in, in America, right? They all mm -hmm. they let their players voice their opinions. They, they don't get in the way, even if it's on controversial topics. And uh, they were looking to embark on a journey in the beverage industry and then also work with uh, a, a mission-based business. Again, we, we checked off a couple of those boxes. So uh, when they reached out to us, it was <laughs> a dream come true because I grew up, I had some hoop dreams and wasn't good right. enough to make it to the league. Uh, but uh, this serves as a, as a dope consolation prize. And um, what makes this partnership with the NBA even more special is the fact that they match that 5% contribution to those wow. organizations uh, with the sale of any product. So you buy some of our um, NBA coffee, that's kind of like doubling the donation, if you will, mm -hmm. to, to those organizations. So it's, a, uh, again, just having shared alignment, shared values, 
is why those partnerships came about. Um, and then finding the most creative way to act against that is what they entail, essentially. Mm. And the good thing, like you mentioned, is that these brands and organizations approach you all. So could you share like how these things and these partnerships have helped to grow your business? Like some of the things that you've seen and witnessed? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it again, it's hard to hard to measure, right? Like these things introduce us to new audiences that we otherwise wouldn't be able to reach on our own or at least mm-hmm. not as fast. Right. Um, it, and it also provides the social proof needed for anyone that's skeptical. And, and trust me, it's no shortage of skepticism in, in our journey. So being mm-hmm. associated with the likes of an NBA or Ben and Jerry or, or having our products available uh, in, in targets nationwide, um, that adds a little bit of ease uh, for people as they look to experience um experience new coffee right like coffee is mm-hmm. such a, an important part of people's day right it, it, it's a it's all it's almost like a ritual if you will and um people are are hesitant to, to branch out and, and try something different so that the social proof of our partnerships with these organizations allow for us to welcome people who are, are looking to try new brands and Rod, one of the things you mentioned earlier is that you all started in the garage. So talk about, because one of the things is that sometimes there be, may be a space where people have experienced this tremendous growth. I'm not sure if you all experienced this, but where they weren't able to sort of meet the demands. So how did you all kind of handle that sudden increase in demand? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So um, very early on, especially during like that viral Twitter moment that I referenced mm-hmm. or, um, you know, a few other tempo moments, we were drinking water from a fire hose. We were uh, wow. a, a one, two, three person operation at times. And um, it, it it forced us to uh, get out of our own way and, and look for some space beyond the garage. So mm-hmm. I mean, we did a lot of late nights, you know, packaging coffee and tea uh, out of a garage. And then it, we eventually um, moved into the back of a brewery. Uh, so there was a, a local brewery that was kind enough to lease us, you know, a little bit of production space. And um, we moved there uh, about, um, let's say four or five months after officially launching in June. Mm-hmm. Um, we stayed there for maybe about a year and a half or so, uh, and then moved into our own facility that then allows us to meet the demand that now exists for our product. So we didn't hire our first employee until maybe a year after mm-hmm. starting the business. Um, and then from there brought on more help as, as we had the capital and the the capital necessary to, to pay these people, right? <laughs> right. So we don't, we're not a volunteer organization and, um, you know, want to make sure that uh, we, we could continue to <laughs> make payroll every week. So we, we slowly but surely brought people on and um, it just was a very organic and grassroots approach. Um, now we have uh, about 25 people on staff in total, including myself and my business partner. Wow. Um, and we are in a 20,000 uh, square foot facility um, that you know houses uh, much different equipment <laughs> right. than what we had in the garage. Wow, that is amazing. Let's talk about growth and scaling. So you all don't just offer coffee. Talk about some of the other products that you offer in some of your latest releases. Absolutely. So um, since our inception, we've offered tea uh, as our reference. Um, I wasn't a coffee drinker. I was definitely more of a tea guy. So Mm -hmm. um, I I wanted to make sure that um, we had some diversity of products um, because not not everybody's a coffee drinker, believe it or not. Um, But tea is very limited in as it pertains to its accessibility. Uh, Tea can only be found online and uh, via Amazon. since then, um, we've released a few new products. In fact, we'd like to consider ourselves an innovation hub of coffee and tea-based beverages. And um, mm-hmm. we um, just uh, announced our 
um, first ready to drink product, which is an eight ounce can of cold brew coffee. Um, oh, so wow. for those who don't necessarily want to one drink hot coffee or be brew hot coffee, you have this convenient way to get the caffeine that you need um, and masked in, in, in a tasty drink. Um, so that was released here uh, at the top of the month, synonymous with our um, anniversary and um, the, the reception has been great. Um, again, this is a it's a convenience play um, and it also can serve as a substitute to some of those sugary energy drinks um, that we as a community uh, have been overly reliant upon due to not having alternatives. So uh, you think about, you know, as you're getting ready to work out rather than smashing a can of uh, of a product and it has ingredients and of, of things that you have no idea what they are. You can mm -hmm. drink cold coffee, get twice as much caffeine, not have that sugary crash and not feel bad about uh, what you're putting into your body. So, you know, this is just us trying to give um, um, our consumers and therefore our community a healthier option to consider um, as part of their, their daily rituals. I love that. Love it, love it, love it. And so how are you all planning for the future and standing out from the competition? I think that we will, you know, continue to bring to market innovative ideas um, uh, around coffee and tea. Like we, we, we got the foundation under us. We, we understand cold bean and ground coffee. We understand um, loose leaf tea. Now it's building upon those learnings and mm -hmm. um, meeting people where they are. There, are. there are a lot of products that people consume that have, that are rooted in coffee and tea. So um, strategically, we'll start to diversify our product portfolio. Um, in addition to that, it, it, we'll just continue to double down on why we exist in the first place. You know, we the, 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 the more our business grows, the more that we're able to reinvest back into our communities. And we just want to continue to lead with that because that's authentically who we are. Like we're not here for any self-interest. We're here because we know that there's a demographic out there that needs but that needs a little bit of a push, needs some resources. Like mm -hmm. we were those kids at one point. And it wasn't like we were incapable of doing more or, or realizing our potential. We just had some obstacles in the way. So right. if we can build this business as a means to eliminate those obstacles for kids, then we feel like that will separate us from, from our competitors. Amazing. And so, Rod, before we um, wrap up, I want to ask some questions that I'm sure the audience will want to know. A little rapid fire. Um, so any tips for those who are listening, how to successfully identify and reach their target audience? Who? Um, that is interesting. So, I mean, there are some like social listening tools, you know, mm -hmm. that you could use like Hootsuite or Sprout. Um, you know, you could see what demographic um, uh, leans or gravitates towards certain hashtags, right? So if you want to start a coffee business and you look up hashtag coffee, who's engaging with those type of social media posts? Um, you There are there's software out there that can help you answer those questions. And then there's more sophisticated reporting um, that exists out there like Mintel and Nielsen um, that... Uh, well, you know, they, they aggregate data across the industry and they got access to so many different and those things are super expensive. So most people can't right. do that. But if you got a deep wallet, then, yeah, I would recommend um, looking in, in, the, in that direction. But um, what you could do very simply is just analyze your competitors and see mm -hmm. um We'll see the makeup of, of that demographic, right? Um, and, and start to, um, you know, assess from there, right? So if you are, you know, for us, it was um, Pete's Coffee. It was Intelligentsia. Uh, so we watched their moves. We watched the people who they were targeting and um, speaking and messaging to. And um, from there, we started to form who our target audience was and ran some tests threw out some messaging, see what resonated. All right, that works, that doesn't work. We'll go back to the drawing board and and, and reassess and, and, and move forward that way. So a lot of the test and learning, I think really is the, 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 the main thing that I'm trying to get across is 
um, because because it's going to continue to evolve, right? Like, right. like unless you have like unless you're selling toys for like children, then your it, it's going your your demographic is going to change essentially. So um, testing and learning is the best way to find out who that target audience is. Love it and great advice. Um, so, what advice would you have for those who are interested in pursuing this industry and some of the things that they should know how to prepare? Yeah, uh, be a student. Um, absorb as much information as you possibly can. Um, find mentors. As I mentioned, you know, Pernell and I watched a lot of YouTube videos. He he watched videos about roasting coffee, and I watched videos on how to build a website and what does mm-hmm. it mean to run Facebook ads. And right, like I, I was responsible for our digital experience, especially very early on. Uh, and P was responsible for our operations. Neither one of us knew what we were doing. So we went to the <laughs> YouTube university and yes. listened to the, the, the people who did it before us. So um, find mentors, even if they are mentors from a distance, um, you know, digest content around supply chain uh, so that you can anticipate curveballs um, and, and just overall, you know, do it afraid. Um, I suffer from analysis paralysis where I need to I need to feel that things are perfect before I take that first step. And that is a huge red flag, in my opinion, for entrepreneurship. And I had to mm-hmm. get over that very quickly. Um, so he, there's never a right time to do it. And um, while it can be intimidating to fly the plane while it's in the sky, that's, you know, we, we don't, I don't have the luxury otherwise. So right. um, doing it afraid is uh, some advice that I give people um, regardless of whatever industry that they are pursuing. But if they are looking to pursue um, the uh, being successful in, in the coffee industry, know that it's a very competitive industry and Therefore, you're going to have to have a differentiator. Ours is rooted in social impact. Um, I, I challenge anyone looking to take on the industry to figure out what is theirs and be unapologetic and authentic about it. Yes, I love that. And um, one of the things also was the fact that you all have been successful in these partnerships. And so that means that you are maintaining and you're doing something right. Any advice for listeners on, you know, maintaining that relationship with your partners? And I know that you mentioned that they approached you, but maybe some tips on how they can be approachable. Yeah, um, I would say listen, you know, uh, yeah. I use Ben and Jerry's, for example, when they reached out, uh, they were asking questions. It wasn't like they reached out only to us. They reached out to a few black owned coffee brands and um, they let us know what their criteria and requirements were to work with them. And some of those things we already were doing. Others we had to build processes around. So, um, you know, listening to the um, listening to the potential or strategic partner and what they need, I think is, is super, super helpful. Um, but in addition to that, ask questions. Um, Pernell and I are, are naturally curious people. And, um, you know, we ask, you know, what does this mean? Or what, what would this type of activation look like? Um, you know, it, does this idea have any potential if we were to add these other elements? The worst thing that a person can say is no. I, mm-hmm. When I was in undergrad, I worked at a call center and I can't tell you how many times people told me no when I called to ask them for a donation to my alma mater. Who I do? Get off my phone. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I built up this this resiliency um, and, and right. understanding that that's literally the worst thing that a person can tell you. But you won't know unless you ask. Right? Closed mouths don't get fed. So speak up and, you know, ask people what they need from me or what they need from you and then vice versa, what you need from them in order to make this mutually beneficial. Love that. And so in all that you've done, uh, what advice would you give to someone in their first year of business? Give yourself some grace, fam. (laughs) You are not going to have all the answers figured out, even if you're an expert in that field. Um, and, and especially now, like you're going to be throwing curveballs and have to pivot weekly, almost daily, right? If you're on mm-hmm. a straight path and you're not suffering from any turbulence, then maybe something is actually going wrong and you just don't know it. <laughs> so, um, 
just give yourself some grace and understand that you don't know it all. You you put yourself in the game, and uh, with that are going to come some some bumps and bruises. Uh, Rome one. I, I got a thousand cliches. Which one you want? Rome one building a day. <laughs> it, like, it, it, that all that stuff is really true. Right? And I, right. I have to tell myself that. Right? It's like I, I'm a go getter. I really want to be successful. And I want to be successful now. But it's like you're doing something that you've never done before, and in fact, that never has been done before. So relax, pump the brakes a little bit, and be present so that you can adjust and, and, and realize the potential of your idea. Yes. And for you, what has been the best risk that you've taken? Um, okay, so I mean, very, when we first started, I was doing both. Uh, I was mm -hmm. still working my nine to five. I was the assistant dean for a, uh, a school of business out in California. Um, and uh, I was so doing nine to five and then coming home doing the five to midnight, right? So that was, that that caused a lot of stress, a lot of, a lot of <laughs> sacrifice mm -hmm. and compromise. And um, I eventually you know, resigned um, and you know, started to do this full time. And even with resigning, um, I moved from Sacramento, California, where I was li living in my best life, uh, and moved to <laughs> Des Moines, Iowa, which is where the business is headquartered. So I would say that, that that risk of quitting my job and then being closer to the operations has has benefited myself and then therefore the, the, the business tremendously. And what tools, what are some of your favorite tools and resources that you can recommend for our audience that have really helped you in your entrepreneurial journey? Tools like to grow my business or like my peace of mind or like what do you mean? Well, it could be either. Some, maybe your favorite tools to calm or maybe your favorite tools to... Yeah. Um, well, I, to calm myself, I love my uh, title app. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big, big music head. I love uh, listening to different types of music. Um, so that is you know beneficial in the ebbs and flows of business of, of just having something to to ground you so to speak. Um, I'm trying to think other things. I mean, you know, from like creating content, you know, mm -hmm. a nice camera, uh, a nice microphone, things of that nature. Um, if I want to get into a lot more um, producing videos to highlight the, the the tasting experience and and brewing process of our coffee so you know we'll use video recording equipment for that um gosh I'm trying to think other tools uh like the calm app i'm a big fan of oh yeah I that's a good need one. to decompress uh and, and get away for essentially so i will say like that that's kind of things that those are my go-to's if you will love it and rod for you what does it mean to be a black man in business uh, it in business. Um, you know, it, it's a journey that I am on with with pride and with confidence. Um, I know the the opportunity that that's in front of me. I'm very aware of that, and I know that there are others that are watching my journey. Um, primarily because I am a, a black man that has found some found some success right. in an industry that doesn't have a lot of black men on the forefront. So um, knowing that I I'd, I'd step into my purpose, like I said, with, with the utmost confidence and um, you know eye on the prize, so to speak. Right? I know what what I know what my goals are. I know what my north star is, and I. Don't let any distractions get me off center, um, because again, I'm. It, I, I know that my journey is part of a bigger story, so that's what that means to me. It means that my my journey as a black businessman is part of a bigger story that um, is necessary for the the next generation to be inspired. Beautiful. I always love when people answer that question. It's always so like I feel it. I yeah, love that. No, that's real. I, I appreciate yeah. you asking. Kind of. It kind of paused me for a second. But <laughs> yeah, it's just like you know, this is um, this is a privilege, right? Like I get, right. I get to do this. It's like I don't have to do this. I'm not forced to do this, but it's like it's a privilege for me to do this. It's a privilege for me to add my puzzle piece to the bigger picture. Yes, 
And Rod, how can people who are listening stay connected with you in Black and Bold? How can they find you all? How can they support you? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we are um, Black and Bold across all social media handles. That's B-L-K and Bold. Um, you can find us like the via Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, TikTok, um, as well as just our website in general, uh, which is blackandbold.com. Uh, find us on shelves at your local Target stores, Albertsons, Walgreens, uh, High V if you're in the Midwest, H E B if you're in Texas, and then online at, at Amazon. So you know, really wherever wherever coffee is sold and or talked about, uh, Black and Bold is there or is on its way there. Love it. Well, Rod, thank you so much for being on the Black to Business podcast, and we'll be sure to know all of those in the show links, um, show notes. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate you. Such a simply amazing conversation. And I always love how transparent guests like Rod get on the podcast. I think one of the major takeaways for me was that you won't always be fully prepared, but when you are so sure on your mission and your North Star, the opportunities that are meant for you will come to you. So maybe you're in your humble beginning stages and I want to encourage you to just keep building, keep working, keep building your solid foundation because it will pay off. And I want to give a special shout out to Black Twitter for pushing the culture forward. As Rob mentioned, the Black Twitter culture exploded their businesses. So make sure that you are doing right by people and that you are staying on Black Twitter's good side. So you can check out the resources mentioned by Rod by visiting blacktobusiness.com forward slash 102. This has been lovely and it's always a pleasure showing up and sharing with you all the dope people in the community who are doing dope things. So don't forget to share this episode with a friend. Until next time.